our joy, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take your Bibles and turn in them to the book of Proverbs and the 11th chapter. Proverbs chapter 11, I'm going to read in a minute, but as you turn there, let me take you back in time to April of 1945. World War II was at that time grinding to a The battles were continuing, much blood was continuing to be shed, but by this time the writing was on the wall. The Allied armies had surrounded Berlin in a ring of steel, and the much vaunted might of the Third Reich was reduced to a desperate struggle in the bombed out ruins of what was once their proud capital. At the center of all of this, the center of Berlin, deep in an underground bunker, the last remaining loyalists were huddled around Adolf Hitler, their great leader, the man who had once proudly strutted wherever he wanted to go in a constant air of arrogant authority. Here he is now in this bunker, reduced to a trembling old man with the twitch in his eye of madness. Mere months before, the vast armies of Germany swore their allegiance to him and roared it out with their voices. He had marshaled the power to challenge and defeat all of Europe, and the team of warlords that he had assembled had driven his military commanders to victory after stunning victory. Whole armies had died for him rather than humiliate him by surrendering. And yet now in April of 45, reality has set in. His glory days are over. His ambitions, just like his troops, have been wiped out. But even here, Adolf Hitler was not about to humble himself. No, completely possessed by the demon pride, when the writing was on the wall, Hitler issued orders as his rage turned from his enemies out there to his own German people. And this is what he said. If the war is lost, the nation will also perish. This fate is inevitable. There is no necessity to take into consideration the basis by which the people will need to continue even a primitive existence. All industrial plants, all electrical facilities, all water supplies, gas supplies, food stores, clothing stores, bridges, railroads, and shops were to be blown up. Germany was to be reduced to a scorched earth because if Hitler's dream was dead, then the whole nation was going to rise up in smoke like a funeral pyre to the death of his dream. Now, that is pride on a massively devastating scale. We don't often see pride with such earth-impacting consequences. But pride is part and parcel of our culture today. From social media influencers posing for their selfies to prize-fighting athletes boasting about how great they are, what they plan to do to their opponent to humiliate him, to musical artists, even some Christian ones, who rap about how much better they are than those who they see as their competition. And in case you think that's a bad thing, the culture of our day doesn't think it's bad at all. Athletes are supposed to have swagger. Music stars are supposed to have boasting. We've set entire months and seasons apart to revel in what we call pride. And in case you think it's a new thing, it's not. Whether it was Frank Sinatra singing, I did it my way, or whether it was Muhammad Ali after defeating Sonny Liston for the Sonny Liston for the Boxing World Heavyweight Championship, shouting his defiant question to the crowd, who's the greatest? Only to have the crowd roar back in response, you are. Those of us from an earlier generation know that pride is no new phenomenon. And the question I want to deal with this morning from the book of Proverbs is What does this book have to say about pride? What's God's verdict? What does wisdom say 
about this phenomenon of pride. Pride is another one of the major themes of this book, and as we've been doing over the last number of weeks, I want us to look at what the whole book has to say about it. So keep your fingers nimble in your Bibles and be ready to move from passage to passage. But let's start by reading from chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 2 and 3, and then I'm going to skip down to verses 9 to 12. Let's pick it up in Proverbs 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Now verse 9. With his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. But by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. But by the mouth of the wicked, it is overthrown. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. But a man of understanding remains silent. This is the word of the Lord. Verse 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. And here it is in a nutshell. Over and over and over again, the Bible says, the book of Proverbs is no exception. If you think you're wise, then you're a fool. But if you are painfully aware of your own foolishness, then you are, or at least you're on your way to becoming wise. Now flip over to chapter 16. Let's take a look at chapter 16 and verse 19. Proverbs 16, verse 19. Better to be lowly in spirit and among the poor than to share plunder with the proud. Let me read that again. It's better to be lowly in spirit and among the poor than to share plunder with the proud. Do you know what that verse is saying? It's saying that humility is more valuable than all of the gold and silver and jewels that lay beneath the earth. We have some young women who can identify very much with the beauty of jewelry. They were given by the men they loved rings that had diamonds on them. And if you ask them what is the most important possession that they have outside of human beings, what's the most important possession they have, they likely would point to the ring on their finger. It is precious to them. The Bible says humility is more valuable than any diamond, any ring, and pride, well, pride is not quite so valuable. In fact, we're going to learn some things by looking at these texts. We're going to learn the diagnosis of pride from Proverbs. We're going to look at the destructiveness of pride in this book. And we're going to look at the antidote for pride. Let's start by looking at the diagnosis of pride. Most of us here this morning, we're pretty good at recognizing pride in other people. Did you see her Facebook post? She is so arrogant, so proud. But how do you specifically define it? Rather than recognizing it, how can we diagnose pride biblically? Because until we have a clear understanding of pride, chances are we will always see it in others, but never in ourselves. And if we don't recognize pride in ourselves, we will remain stuck in the prison of its grip. So what does Proverbs say about it? Well, let's go back to Proverbs 11 and verse 12. Take a look there one more time. Proverbs 11, verse 12. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. I like how the NIV translates that. A man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor. That's important because that's what pride does. Pride is the fuel 
that makes us belittle or deride or look down on other people. It's what makes your heart need to feel better or higher than other people in some way or another. You know, in this book, there are several Hebrew words that are used, that are used and translated in the English as pride throughout this book of Proverbs. They're all translated pride or proud in our English language, but they're actually different Hebrew words in the original. And I want to look at two verses that use the same Hebrew word, the same single word for pride. Take a look at fa- chapter 15. Chapter 15 and verse 25. Proverbs 15 and 25, and then we'll jump to p- chapter 16. First, verse 25 of chapter 15. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. And then verse 19 of chapter 16. Verse 19, it is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. The word that's translated proud in both of these verses is the Hebrew word ge'e means supreme majesty. And it's almost always in the Old Testament applied to God. So to use it for a human being is kind of ironic, but it also makes a very powerful point when you think about it. So let's go back to these two verses and read them with that understanding of the Hebrew word. So 15 verse 25, let's read it with that sense. The Lord tears down the house of the supreme majesty, but maintains the widow's boundaries. And then verse 19 of chapter 16, it's better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the supreme majesties. You get the irony here. The Bible is saying that everyone who is proud is a person who wants to be his or her own supreme majesty. His or her own supreme being. And that makes sense, doesn't it? When you think back to the very beginning of the Bible, the Garden of Eden, the fall into sin of the human race, what was the very first sin? It was pride. When the snake slithers into the garden and comes up to Eve's ankles and tries to lead the first humans and does so successfully to march themselves into misery, remember his method. Remember what he said. You should eat this fruit. Why? Because you will be like God. That's the problem. We are, all of us, by nature, proud. We all want to run our own lives. We want to decide what's right and what's wrong for us. We want to earn our own self-worth. We want to find life's meaning on our own. We don't want to center our lives on God because we want to be God. Lewis Smedes, who's a Christian author, puts it this way. Pride in the spiritual sense is refusal to let God be God. It's to grab God's status for your own self. It's turning down God's invitation to join the dance of life as a creature in his garden and wishing instead to be the creator, independent, reliant on your own resources. And that is the greatest delusion, the delusional fantasy of all fantasies, the cosmic put on. And that's exactly what the book of Proverbs is teaching. Pride is the desire to be our own creator so that we look down on God himself. And if we look down on him, we will certainly look down on other human beings. And we see that kind of pride all over the place, in the most innocuous of places. I was reminiscing this past week about my high school days. And growing up in Richmond in the 1980s, and playing basketball. Well, if you were a boy in the 80s in Richmond and you played basketball, then playing for the Richmond High Colts was the holy grail that you were aiming for. I remember being part of a junior high school that was a Christian school, it was very small. Nobody from my school had ever played for the, made the team of the Colts. Thankfully, as I dedicated myself, the Lord blessed me, I made the team. And one of the side benefits to making the team was the letterman jacket that you got to wear as a member of the high school basketball team. 
And that jacket was a great way to feel part of the team. All of a sudden, your chest puffs out. You're a member of a family that's bigger than yourself. It's a mark of accomplishment. You've arrived. But there was more to it than that. And I saw the same things when a couple of my own boys got their Letterman jackets at Moat playing football. You put the jacket on, and you think, wow, this is so cool. And then you wear it outside, and you see someone else wearing their Letterman jacket from another school, another team. And the first thing you do is you give them the side eye. You look them over, and you kind of make your judgment, and then you think to yourself, wow, we would destroy them. And then you look down on them. We're better than they are, and our jackets are cooler than theirs are, too. That's pride. In C.S. Lewis's famous book, Mere Christianity, he talks about pride. And this is what he says that relates to this. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something. The letterman jacket isn't enough. The car isn't enough. The house isn't enough. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something. Pride only has pleasure in having more of it than the next person. Proud people are not really proud of being successful or intelligent or good-looking. They are proud of having more success, more intelligence, and better looks than the people around them. It's the comparison that makes us proud. It's the pleasure of being better than the rest. It's at work in our kids. It's at work in adults as well. How many of us think to ourselves, we are more intelligent, more sophisticated, more enlightened, and more open-minded than the rest? We are not religious. We are liberal. We watch CBC, MSNBC, and we read the New York Times. We are urbane. And then on the other side, there are those who say, oh, we are better than the rest. We are Christian. We are conservative. We don't watch CBC. We watch Tucker Carlson and read the National Post. We are moral. We are outdoorsy. Doesn't matter how we describe ourselves, the bottom line is we are all of us tempted by the compulsion to feel I am better than others. We're all out there spinning our reputation. And if life is like a lawsuit, and pride drives me to spend my life arguing to the courtroom of the eyes of the world around me, I really count, then we are proud. And everyone's success susceptible to this. And that includes us, too, friends. We live in a society where Abortion and sexual immorality are not just tolerated, but applauded, defended, and paraded. We live in a society where language becomes ever more depraved. Isn't it easy for us as Christians to feel morally superior, proud of how good we are? It's moral pride. And also, chances are, if you're part of this church family, it's because you take biblical study and doctrine seriously. We are a church at Maranatha that isn't content with shallow, culturally driven, cotton candy Christianity that provides no root to hold us firm when the trials of life come and smash us in the face. And that's important, that's, that's healthy, that's critical even. We make no apology here for trusting in the inerrant authority of the written Word of God. We believe in the Bible's inspiration, authority, clarity, and sufficiency. And if the Bible says this is a sin to be repented of, this is the way to salvation and life, and the whole world over there says, no, that's backwards and outmoded thinking, this is the way to life, that's the way to progress, then we in this church will stand on the Bible and the Bible alone. Here we stand, we can do no other. That's important, but it does leave us susceptible to doctrinal pride. The feeling that our theology is better than anyone else's. Well, it is. 
I hope so, but if we're not careful, it's just a short step from that certainty to the pride that thinks, and if my theology is better than his, then I am better than he is. Listen to what Spurgeon wrote 150 years ago. This pride is a protean thing. It changes its shape. It is all forms in the world. You may find it in any fashion you choose. You may see it in the beggar's rags as well as in the rich man's garment. It dwells with the rich and with the poor. The man without a shoe to his foot may be as proud as if he were riding in a chariot. Pride can be found in every rank of society among all classes of men. Sometimes it is an Arminian and talks about the power of the creatures. Then it turns Calvinist and boasts of its fancied security, forgetful of the maker who alone can keep our faith alive. Pride can get in there so insidiously. And a hundred years before Spurgeon wrote those words, Jonathan Edwards wrote these words about spiritual pride. Spiritual pride tends to speak of other persons' sins with bitterness or with laughter and an air of contempt. But pure Christian humility rather tends either to be silent about these problems or to speak of them with grief and pity. Spiritual pride is very apt to suspect others. But a humble Christian is most guarded about himself. He is as suspicious of nothing in the world as he is of his own heart. The proud person is apt to find fault with other believers, that they are low in grace and be quick to note their deficiency. But the humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own heart and is so concerned about it that he is not apt to be very busy with other hearts. So let me ask you a question. Do your theological disagreements with others drive you to look down on them with lovelessness? Now, there are times when faithfulness to the Lord means separating from stubborn compromise in order to maintain purity. But may we be aware of the danger of using purity as a cloak to t cover our own pride-filled hearts. In times of disagreement with brothers and sisters in the Lord, are we willing to walk alongside them, to help them, to follow Paul's instructions to the Galatians? If you see a brother caught in a sin, restore him gently. May we beware of that pride. Now, Proverbs also tells us about pride. The proud person is consistently, desperately aware of himself or herself. We sometimes think that the proud person is the overly confident one, the one who walks with a swagger. And the people with low self-esteem, on the other hand, well, they don't have any pride. They can't. Look how lowly they think of themselves. I say to that, that's not necessarily true, friend. If you are turned in on you, you may feel badly about who you are. You may feel like a failure. You may be constantly down on yourself. You may even tell others what a loser you are, but you're still turned in on yourself. You may not be boasting, but you're just as self-absorbed as the person with the superiority complex, and that's the nature of pride. To be self-aware, to be always thinking, how do I look? How am I doing? How am I performing? How am I being treated? Take a look at chapter 27, Proverbs 27 and verse 1. Proverbs 27, verse 1. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Now, we tend to fixate on the first half of that verse. Don't boast about tomorrow, but don't miss the second half. For you don't know what a day may bring. And the guy who says, I can't do anything right. I failed today. Tomorrow's going to be worse because I can't seem to life. As if my tomorrow is determined by my failures. Well, that's pride too, friend. That's pride. Look at chapter 28 in verse 6. 
makes much the same point. 28 verse 26. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but who walks in wisdom will be delivered. So whether you trust in your own mind for success or failure, I'm going to mess up tomorrow, I know it, you're acting foolishly because your eyes are on yourself. So Proverbs helps us to diagnose pride. Proverbs also points us to the destructiveness of it. Take a look at verse, 11, verse 2 of 11, chapter 11 one more time. We've been there already. Let's take a look again. Proverbs 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Or chapter 16, verse 18. 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now take a look at chapter 18, verse 12. 18, verse 12. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty or proud, but humility comes before honor. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, Humility comes before honor. Now go all the way to chapter 28. 28 verse 14. Chapter 28 verse 14. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. And chapter 29 verse 23. 29 verse 23 one's pride will bring him low but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor now notice the common theme running through all of those verses notice what they all say what they don't say is that pride is dangerous because it might lead you to destruction if you're not careful that's not what it says the verses all say that you are standing on the side of the tracks watching the freight train go by and when you see the engine of pride pass by in front of you, know this, that the boxcar of destruction is coming right behind it. Here comes pride, destruction is right on the way. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But why? Why is that? Why is pride so utterly destructive? I think the Bible and these verses in particular give us two reasons, both the practical reason and the cosmic reason. Let me point quickly to both of those reasons. First of all, look back at chapter 13 again. Chapter 13 and verse 10. Proverbs 13, verse 10. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. NIV puts it like this, pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. It's a good translation. A proud person doesn't learn from mistakes. A proud person doesn't learn from criticism. He just argues. Now, chapter 21, verse 4 Chapter 21 and verse 4. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, are sin. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, are sin. What exactly does this mean? Well, commentators think that this image means something like this. At night, you can only see by the light of your flashlight. There's no light in the sky. Now, I've got a headlight for camping, I wear it when I go camping, and on this particular headlight, it has different colors. It's kind of cool to see how the color of light that you're shining in the darkness determines the colors that you see. So if your lamp is a normal yellowish color, everything is a little bit yellowish. But if you switch to a red light, for example, all of a sudden, everything you see is, is red, which is 
may be helpful. It doesn't shine too much light. It's also helpful. It hides the ketchup stains on your t-shirt. But everything you see is filtered through that light. What this verse is saying is that pride distorts and colors everything you see. Remember chapter 13, verse 10, by insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Wisdom is found in those who take advice, but if you look at your world through pride-filled eyes, all you're going to see is competition, people to be argued with. I said before, you can see pride in others so easily, but it's a lot harder to see it in yourself. So let's ask ourselves, how do I know if I'm proud? How do I know if I'm functioning in pride? Well, let me give you a little test. Some of you have heard the comedian Jeff Foxworthy, who gave a list of, uh, to help you determine whether you're a redneck or not. You might be a redneck if, you maybe heard him, some things like if you ever cut your lawn and found a car, you might be a redneck. Or if you've ever financed a tattoo, you might be a redneck. Or if your dad walked you to school because you're in the same grade, you might be a redneck. Well, let me give you some things to weigh and to help you decide whether you're proud. If you can't admit when you've done things wrong, you can't admit your own weakness, you may be proud. If you can't accept constructive criticism because you don't hear the constructive, all you can hear is the criticism, you may be proud. If every disagreement with another person becomes a personal issue and every problem has to be blamed on other people because you have to maintain that image of yourself as a good person, a smart person, a cool person, a better than others person, you may be proud. If you're in any of those situations, pride is distorting your view and you're going to make terrible decisions. So is there a godly person that you go to in order to seek out advice? Is there anyone that you allow to speak into your life because you'd rather grow into the image of your Savior rather than simply make yourself look better? Again, let me quote from Lewis Smedes. The fantasy that we can make it as our own gods leaves us empty at the center. We are therefore attacked by demons of fear and anxiety all the time. We learn to swagger. We learn to bluff. Deep down inside, we're afraid we can't make it on our own. And therefore, we look around for people to use as buttresses for the shaky ego that our pride has created. And every new person elicits the question, how can this person contribute to my need to prove that I am better than other people? All because we're empty at the center. See, pride is so destructive because it won't allow you to humble yourself enough to listen to godly corrective input and pride will destroy your life. It will. But there's more than just a personal reason to avoid pride. There's also a cosmic reason. Let's flip back to chapter 6 of Proverbs. Proverbs 6, verses 16 and 17. Proverbs 6, verse 16. This is the list of what we've come to call the seven deadly sins. It starts in verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him. And notice the very first item on this list, haughty eyes. That's pride, friend. The Lord hates it. Remember chapter 15, verse 25, the Lord tears down the house of the proud, but He maintains the widow's boundaries. Or chapter 16, verse 5, Take a look at chapter 16 and verse 5 real quick. Verse 5 of chapter 16, Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be sure he will not go unpunished. 
It's a massive declaration of judgment here. The phrase literally would read, whoever is lifted up in heart, those are the people God detests. They will not stand on judgment day. God detests the proud in heart. He cannot stand in their presence and they will not stand in his presence. So why the strong reaction? So much revulsion against the proud. Why is that? It's because they stand in defiance and opposition against all that God is. Remember verse 19 of chapter 16? You can turn there again if you want. You don't have to. Verse 19 of chapter 16, better to be lowly in spirit and among the poor than to share the plunder with the proud. It's an incredibly important theme in the Bible. God loves the widow. God loves the outsider. God loves the poor in spirit. God loves the weak. And that's a staggering truth. Unfortunately, if you spend a lot of time in the church, in Christian circles, you may have become inoculated to just how staggering this truth really is. In Roman and Greek society, pride wasn't a virtue. Yes, of course, you didn't want to have hubris before the gods because they would get angry and they could kill you. But you didn't want to have humility around other people. That was a sign of weakness, subservience. But in the Bible, even though in the ancient cultures the oldest son gets all the power and gets the lion's share of the inheritance and is the one who takes charge when the father passes away, in the Bible, at every generation it seems God works with the younger son. You go through the Bible in your own mind. It was Abel, not Cain. It was Isaac over Ishmael. It was Jacob over Esau. It was Moses over Aaron. Over and over again, God does that deliberately, obviously, to completely turn over the world's understanding of greatness and power. And in all cultures, ancient and modern cultures, the beautiful woman, he's, she's the one that gets the powerful man. But what's the Bible tell us? God works with Sarah, an old barren woman over young Hagar. He works with unloved Leah and makes her fruitful over Rachel. God takes Tamar and works with Rahab and works with these prostitutes. At the same time, he works with Hannah, the woman who is barren and scorned by her adversary. See how in every single spot, God always works with the barren woman, the unwanted woman. God only works through the girl nobody wanted and the boy everyone has forgotten. He passes over the sons of Jesse, seven of them, and chooses David, the forgotten boy who was left out in the field with the sheep. This is our God. In every generation, he loves people who have lost. He loves the losers. And in the struggle of the world for position and power, God loves the weak. He's for the widow. He's for the fatherless. He's for the poor. So why? Is it just because God's a hopeless romantic? He sort of likes the underdog? Or is there something more profound going on here? I say, yes, there is. See, in the Christian Bible... The Old Testament and New Testament, together they speak with one voice and say, our God is a trinity. That from all eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have been. But what do they do with each other? What's the essence of who God is? What has God been doing for all eternity? Well, we get a hint of it in John chapter 17, where Jesus says, to the Father at the very end of his life before he hits to the, heads to the cross. John 17, verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. There it is, John 17, verse 5. Glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world existed. Now, the early Christian theologians, especially in the Greek church, the Eastern church, used to call this, they had a name for the inner life of the Trinity. They called it the perichoresis. It's a Greek word, of course. But you can discern the word choreography in there. And Jesus was saying to the Father, 
the Son, or Jesus was saying that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit from all eternity each gives glory to the other two. Each person adores the other two. Each person loves the other two and delights in the other two. In other words, there's a dance of love going on throughout all eternity. Each person centers on the other, gives glory, doesn't take glory, gives delight, gives love. In other words, at the very heart of this universe, at the very origin of the universe, there is God in an other orientation. See what that means? It means in the very heart of God is a self-giving love. Now, do you see what that means for pride? It means that if you're in the business of trying to get glory for yourself rather than giving it, if you're in the business of scrambling for it, trying to attain recognition, always struggling for recognition and applause, then you're on a collision course with the very fabric and being of God himself because God loves the lowly. God loves to give glory to the humble. Makes an incredible commitment, in fact, in Isaiah 57, verse 15. Why don't you quickly turn there? Isaiah 57, verse 15. Verse 15 of Isaiah 57, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I am God, I live in this high and holy place, but I'm also, I'm also with him who is of a humble and contrite spirit, while the proud, while well, they're from afar. It's not only that you're on a collision course with the very being of God, you're also on a collision course with God's future because the Bible says eventually God's going to lift up the humble. You see that in the text. And he's going to put down the proud He's going to lift up the weak and he's going to put down the strong. So, so how does that impact us? Well, how does it impact the way you use social media? What does it look like to be humble on social media? How does it affect the way that you talk about others? How does it impact the way that you look at other people? If your whole goal in life is to get glory and acclaim and applause and to prove yourself, then you're on a collision course with God's very being and history itself. Pride leads to destruction, Proverbs says. So how does that impact the way that we as a church minister in this world? This year, 2023, happens to be the 100th anniversary of a very important book, Back in 1923, a man named J. Gresham Machen, who was a professor at Princeton until he was forced to leave because Princeton was going far away from the scripture and he began Westminster Theological Seminary. Well, he looked at the dangers in 1923, the dangers he saw threatening the Western church, and he wrote a book entitled Christianity and Liberalism. Very important book. I'd recommend it if you haven't read it yet to pick it up and read it. Listen to his concern already back then. The fundamental fault of the modern church is that she is busily engaged in an, in an absolutely impossible task. She is busily engaged in calling the righteous to repentance. Modern preachers are trying to bring men into the church without requiring them to relinquish their pride. They are trying to help men avoid the conviction of sin. The preacher gets up into the pulpit, opens the Bible, and addresses the congregation somewhat as follows. You people are very good, he says. You respond to every appeal that looks toward the welfare of the community. Now we have in the Bible, especially in the life of Jesus, something so good that we believe it is good enough even for you good people. Such is modern preaching. It is heard every Sunday in thousands of pulpits, but it is entirely futile. Even our Lord did not call the righteous to repentance, and probably 
we shall be no more successful than he. As a church in our age, can't you believe, can you believe that was 100 years ago? He could have been writing that this very year. If we seek to affirm people in their pride, we are going against God's word and we will have no success, eternal success. Well, I know you don't want that. You're here because you want God's best for yourself and for us. So how do we deal with pride? Let's wrap things up with pride's antidote. And to get pride's antidote, we've got to go back to the theme verse, the motto of this entire book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. Proverbs 1, verse 7, I hope some of you have it memorized by now. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the antidote to pride, you see what this says for that? The antidote for pride is not self-esteem, it's a God-esteem. It's a magnificent, humble self-forgetfulness that focuses on the Lord, fearing Him, reverencing Him, loving Him, consumed with God, not me. Sometimes I think about the form of ministry that God has put me in with my life, and I have to laugh. I've wanted to serve the Lord in some way for as long as I can remember, since I was a kid. But I used to, when I was a kid, think that serving the Lord for me would be serving Him as a church member with a career in a different field. Maybe, as I got older, I thought maybe I could be a youth pastor. They play games, they have fun with the kids, they go out for coke. But if you would have told me when I was in high school, even in the first years of Bible college, that I would be standing up in front of a congregation, preaching a sermon, week after week, well, I would have laughed or cried if I thought you were really serious. I grew up in church listening to sermons. The thought of being able to prepare a message from the Bible and talk for 45 minutes plus every week, I could never do that. I keep a word count since I preach from a manuscript. I keep a word count, and usually my messages are somewhere in the 5,000 to 5,500 word realm. I remember back in high school, the most terrifying assignments ever were the research papers write a 1,000-word paper on Shakespeare's The Tempest. That was the stuff of nightmares, seriously. In fact, in many cases, I just didn't even get my assignments handed in. One paper per term, and I couldn't keep my head above water. And it wasn't completely that I was utterly lacking in intelligence. I just didn't know how to do academic paper. I didn't know how to organize my thoughts, so I just tried to coast and do as much as I could in class. Well, there was a young man in our church. His name was Terry. And he had grown up in our church family, but he was several years older than me. He was in the next stage of life, so we hardly ever spoke. I was still in high school. He had just finished university, and he was a new teacher. And not only was Terry older and more mature, but Terry was also really, really cool. Man, was he cool. He had been one of the leaders of my boys' brigade group when I was a little kid. And I remember him way back then, when I was a preteen child. He had the cool, long hairstyle. He had the coolest Adidas running shoes I had ever seen when I was still wearing North Stars. Some of you remember North Stars. That was for all the kids that couldn't afford the Adidas. And then when he got his first car, Terry didn't just get a beater like I drove. He bought himself a 68 Camaro RS convertible in blue. One of the coolest cars I had ever seen. If anyone had a reason for pride that would look down on a high school punk as irrelevant, it was Terry. And I seriously don't know how he thought to ask, but one day, when I was sinking beneath the waves of assignments in school, he approached me and asked if I would be interested in learning some study skills. I said, well, let me think about that. Okay. 
So one evening I went to his mom's place where he was still living and he walked me through how to study, how to take notes, how to organize your notes and how to put together an outline and a paper. I think I've lost my mic. That helped me get through high school, through Bible college, through seminary. And the skills he taught me back then are the very skills that, that I use to prepare sermons today. Without the help of Terry from Richmond Baptist, I wouldn't have lasted one week in the pulpit, let alone two and a half decades. See how God used a, a humble man who didn't think too highly of himself, who didn't think too lowly of himself, who didn't think about himself at all, but just looked for a need that God could use him with his gifts to meet. Humility conquered pride in his life. And I happen to know that Terry continues to teach today around the world doing seminars and sessions and is one of the most positive people I know. And that's no accident because it's exactly what God promises in this book, Proverbs 16, 19, better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor, insignificant child than to divide the spoil with the proud. And I have to say, to your credit, I look around at this church family and I see that same attitude here among us. When I see adults volunteering to go upstairs during the service and teach our kids in Lighthouse, try to maintain some semblance of order in the chaos up there and impart something of the knowledge of God and His Word, I see that humility. And when I see our young adults who are busy with young adult lives, going to school, starting careers, developing romances, and yet investing week after week in the youth of our church, I see humility in action. And can you imagine the radical countercultural force in this world marked by pride if we were all living in that God-besotted humility? There's only one motivation that can keep you going in pride conquering humility. And that's the motivation that comes from the example of Jesus. With, with this I close, take your Bibles and turn to the New Testament and the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two, verses six to 11, five to 11, sorry. Here's a New Testament explanation of what Proverbs is teaching us about humility. Philippians 2 verse 5, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The problem with pride is that it leads the puny creature to lift itself up against God but in Jesus Christ, the infinite creator, God steps down. And if nothing is too high for us to try to grasp up for, then nothing was too low for Jesus to stoop down to. We make ourselves big deals. The Son of God made himself nothing. He humbled himself to death, death on the torturous experience of a cross, and he did it for you and me. And the stunning reality is that this humble God loves us proud sinners, and he's determined to glorify us. But it's got to be in his way, and it will be in his time. It will be by his grace alone. 
and it will be as we humble ourselves here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that guides us, that saves us from ourselves. Thank you for your word that points us to the struggles we know we face, but we so often don't want to confess or own up to. Thank you for the spotlight that your word shines in the deepest parts of our hearts. And Lord, there is not a one of us in the sound of my voice today who doesn't struggle in one way or another with pride. Lord, I pray that you would show us where our struggle is. I pray that you would give us hearts that overflow with delight in Jesus Christ and follow the example that he set for us even as he saved us by his own finished work so that not to gain your favor, not to earn your applause, but out of the overflow of love received, you would help us to walk in humility, to love those around us through Christ and point them not to us, but to you. Lord, would you do your work in us so that you can do your work through us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.